we had a slight disaster last Thursday with, well, we didn't, I did, uh, with the uh, headset, my USB headset. Uh, it is kaput. And if you try listening to the video on YouTube, you realize it was really scratchy and a lot of audio uh, dropped out. So I'm using my emergency uh, microphone here for my iPhone. This will work and uh, we'll try to record with that and hopefully next week uh, we'll have another lecture on Tuesday. Thursday we have exam two which we'll talk about in just a minute. I'm still waiting for you guys to be quiet now. Well, the less time we have for me to get you ready for the exam, I mean, it's, we have a fairly limited lecture today other than exam preparation. The, the lecture from last Thursday, L16, Uh, was uh, it's it's going to have to be re-recorded. So after the noon lecture, I'll try to I'll get this um, podcast uploaded, and I'll get the noon lecture uploaded, and then I'll re-record last Thursdays, and it will um, be for everybody. So I apologize for that equipment malfunction. Interesting quote from Albert Einstein today. If you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough. And I love this because it really is a good description of the entire scientific enterprise or a feature of the entire scientific enterprise. We have this belief that the universe is simple and that the scientific expression of truth in the universe is the simpler the better. And Einstein was a big proponent of it, but not the only one. There's a lot of guys that have um, had that kind of as their uh, scientific ethical uh, inclination. And so understanding it, um, it, it should be a fair, it, whenever you try to, to explain something, if it doesn't come out in a simple manner, like E equals MC squared is enormously important, but fairly simple as an equation. So if you don't explain it in a simple manner, uh, you got some more work to do. And most scientists take that attitude. And when, you, and here's another way to look at it, two, two different ways to look at it. A lot of times in lecture, I'll try to burn you guys when you answer a question. And I'll, I'll ask for, okay, well, what's the kinetic energy of this? And somebody say, will say, oh, well, the kinetic energy is 23.52 joules. And I'll try to, I'll try to you know, uh, dog you and push you away from that answer, even though I know it's correct, just to see if you are persistent in your knowledge of what you have calculated. Are you confident? Because if you're not confident, basically, you don't know it. And so that's related to this. Another way to relate to this saying of Einstein, when we do those code questions, you know, where you, I give you like a dictionary, and each word or phrase has a letter, and then you type in the letters in code to symbolize a sentence that hopefully is true about the question that I'm asking you, the simpler that code is, the better. And we only have like 14 characters. That should be enough, you know, depending on the dictionary I give you, the code table, uh, that should be enough for a lot of different scientific concepts. So uh, that comes out in simplicity. So a four-character response is sometimes the best. And a 14-character response is maybe an indication that either you're a 
your clicker is a is a big mouth. I'm not going to say anybody here is a big mouth, but your clicker is is loquacious, uh, but maybe not correct. So, anyways, this is a great quote from Sir Albert Einstein, uh, one of the great ones. Uh, all right, SI. A couple things to announce. Uh, I don't believe they're equipped with neuralizers yet, like the MIB, but they do have a review set up for exam two, and that is going to be Wednesday, tomorrow, October 21st, 5 to 6.50 p.m. In this building, 101, classroom building two, 101, that's down on the first floor. Is that one of the big, whoa, ooh, Shia gets the big, the big arena. These, it's it's going to be different. It's going to feel different. It'll be good. So try to get to that if you can. I'll be having office hours, as always, from 9 a.m. to noon in the Physical Science Building, room 158, the sunroom, the solarium, uh, right by the main entrance. Uh, so try to get to that if you can't. If you can't make it to Shy for this review or to the uh, SI this afternoon, uh, the regular SI t this afternoon at, at 4.30, uh, then you can maybe get to my office hour. So if you get to all three of them, great. The more the better. Okay, there's a new location for the Monday sessions. Uh, did, you, did you have a bunch of people yesterday? Okay, so NSC, that's the, no, what is that? Nicholson uh, Communication Building, Nicholson. School of Communication, uh, room one, one. Is that a big lecture hall too? Or it's a classroom? Okay. Anyway, so uh, make a note in your notes uh, about that. And uh, we'll talk, in, we're going to talk a little bit about gravitational orbits today. And then I'm going to review with you stuff to think about for. Uh, preparing uh, yourself for the exam on Thursday. And the exam on Thursday is going to be very similar to uh, exam one. And so just be ready, you know, to think, think, think. Get your brain ready. The calculations will probably be a little bit more extensive this time, but you're still going to find things challenging. Uh, uh, Concept-wise, as always. Question? A practice exam on web courses, that's Shai's gig. And I, I'm not, because I don't, I don't put practice exams. Uh, but Shai's going to have, you know, I think she's going to have. Yeah, so go to the SI review and you'll find out. And I know that was a pretty, uh, people were using that pretty heavily last time, which is good. Another question about getting ready for the exam. Actually, I don't want questions now, because we're going to have time for questions after this. Uh, last time we talked about conservation of energy. And we worked a table. This one was from Homework, the Tweety Bird Turbo Jam, which I think caused a lot of discombobulation for some of you. But, you know, I, I typed in an answer or some tips uh, in one of the threads. This one was uh, Caroline's. Uh, I don't know if she's in this section or the noon section. Uh, she asked me, is anybody able to figure out 15? And so I typed in a series of tables uh, like that to guide her through the concept of using a table and the conservation of energy to just kind of fill in as many blanks until you can connect directly to the one that you want. Now that particular problem, number 15, you had to get a kinetic energy in the table and then you had to break it down one half mv squared to solve for v. And it was, you know, I, was, I, I responded to a thread this morning in discussions, uh, which was out there over the weekend. Uh, and uh, uh, what is the formula? I, I've tried every formula. 
for this problem. The problem with that outlook is it's not a single formula. You have, in a problem like number 15, you have to make a lot of decisions to fill out this table properly. And then only at the very last, when you get this particular cell, Tweedy's, or the kinetic energy of the basketball at Tweedy's elevation, only then can you apply 1 half mv squared. The rest of the time, you're using conservation of energy. Question. What? Repeat that. I never said that. Yeah, that's how it ended up being. But don't. No, it's, that, don't let that be a coincidence. Calculate it. It's a hard. Every calculation has got to be a hard calculation if you know what you're doing. So don't, you know, don't. Sometimes, if I give you something and the answer t turns out to be one. Don't always assume the answer is going to be one. Just do the calculations. Go where the numbers tell you. All right? And it, that's, if I, th that's true if I give you a single meter of drop distance. But on this problem, you may or may not have gotten a single meter of drop distance. Chances are you didn't. So then you're SOL, unless you know how to handle any elevation change. And that's what I'm saying, okay? You're not always going to get, you know, weight force... Uh, and a one meter drop, and then yeah, the change in kinetic energies for one meter drop is going to be the same number as the weight force. But see, a weight force is newtons, and a change in kinetic energy is joules. So if you do that on the test, I'm going to mark it wrong. Okay? No, I'm not going to mark it wrong. The computer's going to mark it wrong. In other words, Think about what you're doing. Don't just breeze through. You know, there's no coincidences. All right. All right, now here's a slide where I mentioned that I'm going to re-record the L16 lecture. So look for that. Mm, maybe supper time. I'm going to be here pretty late working on stuff. Don't forget to look at the dot cam images, uh, the PDFs, which are also up in uh, web courses. I want to do a clicker question with you concerning the dot cam tables. All right, so get your clicker ready. And then we're going to talk about gravitational orbits. Now, as I mentioned uh, previous to exam one, and I'll mention again right now, the first mm, four or five questions, five or six questions on the exam will be... Uh, Formula matching. All right, so you have to you'll you'll have to recognize a formula and kind of know in your mind uh, the basic idea of what it is, but you don't have to memorize certain things because you're going to be matching it up with something, you know, on the other side of the page or up, up above it, I guess. Okay, A, B, C, D, and E. All right, but you still um, have to use. So formulas, and I have a feeling that this formula is going to be on the test. I just have this feeling. So maybe you should just take a look at this question and do your best to answer it. And if your clicker is not, not taking the base, hold the uh, button down and until you get the square flashing and then type in BB. Oh, I forgot to calculate. I had to regrade the second lecture's exams, so I don't really, and I didn't do the aggregate average. It was, it was high 60s, low 70s somewhere. I tried to make it 70. And we were, I think we we're a little bit low. Um, this one hopefully will be a little bit high. Okay, so. Yeah. yeah, it's usually there's a lot of variation. 15 seconds.
I don't know. Sometimes it helps if you go like this. <laughs> oh boy, I don't like that. Do you have a? You're gonna. We only have one question today, so you're gonna be all right for today. Um, do you have a friend that's got one? See if you can register it and use it. Can you use it during lecture? Do they need it on Tuesday and Thursday? I'm sure I can try to get one. It's okay. Thank you so much. Okay. Yeah. Uh, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Stop. Yeah. You guys are. Now, option A up here. Actually, this is a, a legitimate physics formula, kinetic energy minus potential energy, but that's not the total mechanical energy. That's a different energy-related quantity that we use in uh, advanced physics. Uh, this one, uh, what does that look like? Pythagorean theorem, yeah. So that's okay. That's probably no good ski, and it isn't. Uh, this one is an energy equation, but it's not the conservation of energy, All right? So, um, so remember that uh, on the exam uh, tomorrow, uh, Thursday, uh, you will have some some formula matching, and. You're going to be thinking about energy a lot, but you know F equals ma. It's it's, it's still you're not we're not done with F equals ma. Weight force equals mg. We're not going to be done with that till December when you guys take your final. Then we'll be finally done with that. You guys will be, but um, so it's not supposed to be cumulative, but effectively, yeah, it's it's cumulative. All right, now. I want to teach you some, st some interesting things about ellipses, which you might actually remember some of this from high school if you took trig or geometry class. An, el an ellipse, a true ellipse, uh, not just a general oval, you know, like the Indianapolis uh, Speedway, is oval, they call it, it's a you know a big looping track, but it's not a true ellipse. I don't know if there's any uh, racetracks that are actually ellipses like this, but supposedly um, it's, if you take a regular cone that's not tilted to one side, but just straight upright, uh, an ellipse is a slice of that. You know, you take a, a flat knife and just kind of slice through there, uh, on a slant, uh, then you get an ellipse, or the edge of the cone. You know, the cone comes apart, and the and the surface that's left of that cone is an ellipse. Okay, and you kind of see it in this picture. They're called conic sections. An ellipse is a conic section. There's, in other words, section meaning cross, like a cross section, like you you know you take your Ginsu knife and you slice right through it. Okay, here's another picture of uh, a slightly different angle. And actually, the full conic section, you need uh, cones high and low. You know, the upper one that opens upward and the, the lower one that opens downward. Okay, so here's an ellipse, and let's just go through a few of the key properties. Uh, the key properties are it has uh, a semi-major axis, and eccentricity. So this particular ellipse, I made it to be a width uh, to height ratio four to one. So try to make your ellipse look like mine as well as you can. All right? And if you have graph paper, you can do it pretty carefully. Now notice that there's no straightaways on this ellipse. So it's not like the Indianapolis Speedway, which has speed, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, straightaways. Okay, this one's always curving. There's no straightaways on a true ellipse. So um, what I did with this, you know, in my keynote application, 
I can set the width and the height. So I set the major axis, that's the sideways axis, the biggest axis, to be 400 pixels. And here's the line segment for that. That's the major axis. Now, ellipses are actually classified by the quantity known as the semi-major and the semi-minor axis. The semi-major axis is exactly half of the major axis. Hopefully that appeals to your sense of the word semi. Now on this one, it, the height to width ratio, excuse me, the width to height ratio is four to one. The width is actual physical 400 pixels. So the minor axis, top to bottom, right through the middle, should be 100 pixels, and that's how I set it. Okay, so here's the line segment for that. So that's the one that goes top to bottom right through the middle. And hopefully your sketch looks symmetric. Raseel, what are you doing way back there? All right. And so the semi-minor axis, that's another, I don't know why they decided to do it that way, but actually it kind of makes a little bit of sense when we care, compare ellipses to circles. But um, now the eccentricity of this one, it's actually related to Pythagorean theorem. So there's squares of semi-major, squares of minor axis, semi-minor axis, and then a square root. But the, you just go ahead and write down eccentricity 0 0.9862. All right. And you can look that up, you know, the, the functions of an ellipse if you care to know it. But uh, for a 4 to 1, width to height, 400 pixels by 100 pixels. Um, and actually, 4 light years by 1 light year, 4 to 1, any size uh, scale, the eccentricity would be 0 0.9862. And the students, the eccentricity uh, tells you you know how elongated it is. Now the reason that that's important is because a circle is also an ellipse. A circle is a special version of the ellipse with zero eccentricity. So uh, a, a kind of spindly looking extended ellipse is, uh, has an eccentricity greater than zero and a circle has exactly zero. For its uh, now, the other cool thing about the circle, and this is probably why they classify things uh, for regular ellipses in terms of its minor, excuse me, in terms of its semi-minor and semi-major axes, is that uh, the ma the major axis of a circle and the minor axis are equal, and they're basically known as a diameter. So the semi-major axis is the same as the semi-minor axis for a circle only, and the other name for uh, that line segment in a circle, you know, I should have made this into a clicker question. Uh, what would you call, let me sh see a show of hands, think about it. What would you call the semi-major axis or the semi-minor axis of a circle? What, what would you call it? Radius, correct, right? So that, you know, and a circle only has one radius. Matter of fact, a circle is defined as the set of points that are exactly that distance, the radius, away from the center of the circle. Now, you can't do a simple formula like that for an ellipse. It's a little bit trickier, uh, and a circle is a lot better. Circle has rotational symmetry uh, all the way around, and ellipse that's not a circle with some eccentricity, does not have rotational symmetry. Although an ellipse with eccentricity does have left and right high and low symmetry. But only for two different, you know, the major axis and the minor axis. Now those are the two axes that you have the flip-flop left and right or flip-flop top to bottom. A circle, you can take any diameter at any tilt, not just sideways and, and vertically, 
any tilt and do flip-flop uh, left for right uh, for any diameter on a circle. So the circle's got a ton of different symmetries to it. Question in front. So um, the width height goes along with the major and minor axis because it's 400. Yes, in the blue box up here, the, the width to height, I just decided to make a 4 to 1 ellipse. And so I decided I could have gone 200 for the width and 50 for the height. But I want it to be fairly big, so I made it 400 and, and 100. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's the ratio of, of width to height. Okay. All right. Now, um, that's ellipse and circle. Now, here's a cool thing that Sir Isaac Newton proved. He proved that any orbit in a gravitational field is a conic section. Now, here are the other conic sections. The first two you know, circle and ellipse. But the parabola, which we have studied and which we're going to talk about today, is also a conic section. And the parabola is one where you slice through with your meat cleaver exactly parallel to the slope of one of the sides. So this ellipse here, you're not quite parallel to the other side, but the parabola is parallel. This parabola is sliced through parallel to this left-hand side of the cone. Now, this third concept here, or excuse me, the fourth, the hyperbola is different again. And that's if you go exactly vertically through the cone, you know, so like a guillotine drops straight down. So if you put your cone in a guillotine, you'll get a hyperbola because it slices right through there. All right. And this looks a little bit slidey. It looks a little bit slanty over here. But supposedly the hyperbola is a, just a straight drop guillotine type shape. And Sir Isaac Newton proved Okay, if the, the law of universal gravitation, g times m1 times m2 over r squared, if it has 1 over r squared in the formula, you'll always get ellipses like this. Or, excuse me, you'll always get one of these conic sections. And there's a fourth conic section that if you just skim right along the, the surface of the cone with your meat cleaver or your knife, uh, you get a straight line. Okay? So that's the intersection of your, your knife blade and the, and the cone if you just barely tan, touch tangent to the cone at one place. So a straight line is also a gravitational trajectory. And that's our simplest one, free fall, straight down. All right, now, a couple things about this I want to um, elaborate, specifically with circle and ellipse. And, be, and the reason we're going to do this when, when we talk about angular momentum, not today, but next Tuesday, and sorry, I couldn't uh, finish my chapter for you before today, so we'll talk about angular momentum next Tuesday. Um, we're still going to need to look at circles and elliptical orbits. Now, here's an interesting fact that a scientist named Johannes Kepler found well before the days of Sir Isaac Newton. And he found by looking at the orbits of the planets, which even the uh, ancient Babylonians and the Egyptians, the Greeks and all that, they knew the paths that these things, you know, they had been tracking the planets through the skies for many, many centuries, thousands of years, um, based on their, you know, the Mesopotamians, based on their religion, and I think the Egyptians as well. Now, Kepler was observing these and taking really careful records, and he said, whoa, I think all the planets, they're not on circular orbits, they're actually on elliptical orbits. And he said the sun is actually at the focus of the ellipse. Now, here's a really eccentric 
uh, ellipse over here, the same one, 4 to 1, eccentricity 0 0.9, etc., etc., etc. All right. This green dot here where my cursor is on the right side of the diagram for this ellipse, that is where the focus is for the ellipse. All right. Now, if you, if you go back and look at some, uh, some, a, a web page about ellipses, they'll show you how to make the, fo figure out where the focus of the ellipse. We know what a focus is uh, for um, headlights. A headlight or a spotlight is a parabolic shape with the light source, the light bulb, right at the focus of the parabola. And if you put the light source right there, the light rays reflect off the parabolic reflector and go straight ahead. That's how you get a, a real spotlight. And if, you're, if your light source is a little bit away from the focus, it'll spread out a little bit. But if it's right at the focus, you get a good tight spotlight. Okay, and that's how we make uh, uh, good headlights, stuff like, like your high beams. Okay, anyway. So here's the focus. Now the focus of a circle, the special ellipse called a circle, is right at the center. That's the easy one. And what Kepler found was that every planet that he had tracked, so uh, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, those are the naked eye planets, uh, he found that they all follow an ellipse. Now, they weren't as elliptical, as eccentric as this one, um, but we've since found that even stuff like comets, uh, for instance, will follow an orbit like this. Everything that's bound to the sun will be on an ellipse for which the focus is the sun itself. And every ellipse has two foci, one focus on the right side of the major axis, one focus on the left side of the major axis. And the sun is always... Uh, at one of the foci. And the other foci is just a mathematical point. There's no planet there or anything or sun or anything like that. But uh, yeah. So this is what we found. Now, here's the focus for the circle. And this green... So that's like where the... If the, if the Earth were on a perfectly circular orbit, that's where the sun would be in relation to Earth's orbit. Now... Earth's orbit really is pretty close to a perfect circle. But Earth's orbit is not a perfect circle. It does have some eccentricity. Mars has a, quite a bit of eccentricity. Okay? And the moon has some eccentricity on its orbit around the Earth. For the moon, the, Earth, the center of the Earth is the focus, is at the focus of the moon's elliptical orbit. So here's the focus uh, for the eccentric orbit of the comet. Okay. Now, these particular, this planet and this comet would look about like this. All right. They're the same semi-major axis, but definitely different shapes. And here's the cool part. You can make a note of this. These, try to make your sketch look like mine, okay? It's kind of hard. I see a guy in the middle of the room shaking his head. No, Dr. B, I can't try that. Do your best. Try to make your sketch look like mine, if you can. They're the same width, but, and, but the, and the sun is at the focus of, both of, of either of these, but the shapes are different. Now, here's the cool thing. They have the same semi-major axis, and what Kepler also found, not only are they ellipses, but if they have the same uh, semi-major axis, they have the same orbital period. In other words, one full lap around this comet's orbit takes the same amount of time as one full lap around this big ginormous orbit for, on a circular uh, orbit. Okay, so the Earth is like this quite a bit, right? But a comet that comes, you know, close to the Earth's orbit, this comet 
would orbit the sun once per year. And we have comets uh, that do orbit on, on the basis of a fa fairly close to a year. All right. And other orbits, you know, they're, they're apogee, or excuse me, they're aphelion. The farthest point from the sun is out like about uh, where Jupiter is. Uh, they take about the same time to go around the sun as Jupiter does. So, in other words, several years. But we see those uh, comets all the time. And there's comets that are way, very eccentric, way out there. They spend most of their time in the outer part of the solar system, uh, like Halley's Comet and, and other comets that are really, really long period. Okay? So, I want to talk about these last two, and then two more paths uh, on the document camera uh, with you uh, as a way of summarizing some of the things that we know. So let me go to the document camera now and I'll turn up the lights because I know you guys can see fairly well from the doc cam. And let me switch over to the document cam. I'm going to keep recording and hopefully... Hopefully this podcast will come out a little less scratchy than last Thursday. Okay, let me get out my notes. And actually what I'm going to do so that this fits into the podcast, I'm going to use my notebook like this. Just a second, students. Let me move this over. Just do a few things here. It's always a little tricky when I'm going to do a document camera lecture. Just a second. Okay. So, this is October 21, 20th. Okay, and this is uh, section 0001. Let me bring this a little bit closer. Simplest of all the gravitational trajectories, straight line, downward, free fall. From y, from along the y-axis. And you don't really need to worry about the x-axis. Here it is if you want. So you could be going from 40 meters up. And that's a pretty good tall distance. That's about the size of a building. And... Uh, Are there lights over there? Light switches over there? On the wall there, is that it? You wanna try those? Sorry, man. Sorry to interrupt your Facebook session. Okay, how's that? Okay, good, thanks. All right, and I can see, let me try this. Ooh. Uh, wait a minute. There we go. That's pretty good. Okay, so mm, this is like about the size of a building. Okay, so a big building downtown. Now let's review what we know. Okay. This is always appropriate. Uh, 
Let's take another point down here. Go ahead and put something, not at halfway, just kind of down below halfway point a little bit. Uh, so we'll call this y equals y1. Now we know that yf is equal to yi plus viy times t plus one half gt squared, g is negative in this application. If it's a drop, then VIY is zero. And we know how to do that. So this would be YF equals 40 meters uh, plus a negative 4.9 meters per second squared times T squared. Okay, so we know that from last time or from before the first exam. The thing that we also know is that P subscript Y is equal to M times VY. Okay, now for drop, for a drop situation, um, if you start with zero here, this is going to be M times G T, this being your new speed. And so that's going to be m times negative 9.8 meters per second squared times t. So that's your downward or the vertical component of your momentum. Now energy-wise, Delta Y um, let's say we're trying to figure out things the energy state at this unspecified height so this could be like you know 2.3 meters or 23.5 meters or anything like that we know that Delta Y is later minus initial so that's Y1 minus 40 meters. Okay, there's my delta Y. And my gravitational potential energy is equal to mg, and I'll put parentheses around it. Hey, you know, in accounting, they use parentheses to, anybody in an accounting major? or bit? They use parentheses to indicate negative, right? Okay, I'm going to start doing that. So this means negative 9.8 meters per second. Okay. Oh, sorry. I'm not going to do that. For this one, we use... All right. For GPE, we don't use the minus sign. Okay, delta kinetic energy is equal to F parallel times delta Y, and F parallel, now for this you have to use the minus sign. So here I'm going to use a minus sign. So the change in the kinetic energy and the change in the potential energy are opposites of each other, and that is why the energy is conserved. Question. Are you saying M times the opposite of G by saying this? Or are you saying M times this? this? What I mean by this is M times negative 9.8 meters per second squared times delta Y. And up here, M 
times positive 9.8 meters per second squared times delta y. Okay, so this is positive when this one is negative, all right, and vice versa. So, comments. GPE decreases when delta y is negative. Okay, in other words, if your y coordinate is getting smaller, i.e. dropping, you're losing potential energy. But by the same token, kinetic energy increases when delta y is negatory. All right? And for that reason, so I'll put a summation bar underneath here. For that reason, E is equal to a constant if it's composed of kinetic energy summed with GPE. So if I ask you about a uh, one kilogram object falling off of a 40 meter building, you're going to be thinking about some of this stuff here. Okay. Uh, yeah, this one's a negative up here. Okay. That's a good notation to remember. Questions? Yes? Here? This one, where do I get the negative 4.9 meters per second squared? Uh, that's one half of G. Okay, so I just kind of skip down there. It's just Dr. B's slacking method. You know, instead of writing 0 0.5 times 9.8 meters per second squared, I just write 4.9, or negative 4.9 in this case. Another question. Yes. Because it, if you do a positive 9.8 here, it obeys this principle here. We want something that's high when it's up high. So if you're up on top of that 40 meter building and you don't have any kinetic energy, you're just holding that water balloon, you don't have any kinetic energy, but you've got plenty of potential to acquire uh, kinetic energy. And that's how the whole concept of potential energy. So, it's, it's like storing energy in a, actually like the water tower. You know, we put water, we pump water to the top of the water tower and then just let gravity push it around campus to, you know, all the different, you know, faucets and stuff that we have. All right, so that's how we use. So that's, the whole idea is that potential energy is the stuff that if you're, if you're, if you're getting delta Ke, in equal bite size chunks for every meter, what's it delta what's it delta ing with? What is it changing with? Okay, so like so like when you when you have skateboarders, there's a little bit of delta P this way and the same amount this way. Okay, good. Now on a free fall trajectory, meter by meter, you're losing the same amount of kinetic energy for every meter of drop. So Who's gaining it? You know? And the, the answer to that question is GPE. It's abstract. It's def I mean, all this stuff is abstract, except for these positions. This is measurable. All this other stuff is abstract, which we construct so that we can understand rockets going to the moon. 
and all kinds of other good stuff. Another question. Okay, let's go to the next trajectory. Page two. And this one is going to be a parabola on Earth. Okay, so let's draw No, I can't. Uh I don't think I can. Is that better? Do you guys like that better? Yeah. All right. I don't like it, but cuz it's really dim up here. Okay, so make a rectangle like this and then cut it in half because a parabola has symmetry left and right. Here's our launch point. Okay, so we'll call this H for home plate. And here's our landing point. We'll call this letter O for outfield. Up here is point A for apogee, the high point of the trajectory. And my parabola is going to start out. Um, actually, go ahead and draw a dotted line. Uh, take your, your left hand half and cut it in half again so that you actually have uh, two equals, so a quarter of your rectangle. It, if you work out all the physics and stuff, this, this, bo this box here, a quarter of the big rectangle that completely encloses the trajectory is the direction of launch. So go ahead and draw a dotted line like that. And draw a vector indicating the initial velocity, V subscript I. That looks pretty good, I guess. Now, so that's your launch velocity, but this is where you come to um, apogee. So your trajectory is going to start out this way and just kind of ease over so that it's going perfectly flat right there. Now right here, the velocity, I'll call it V subscript A, is exactly horizontal. Now if you do a, a similar size box over here in the right hand half, cut that in half so you have another, this is going to be your landing angle down here. So your parabola, I'm going to twist this like this a little bit here. It's going to go like this and kind of ease down gracefully. Well, that's not very graceful, but on a computer you can do it perfectly. Now, on this one, we know all kinds of stuff. Energy. Ah, uh, ditto. So if this is, let's put my x-axis through here and my y-axis here. If this is y equals 40 meters here, okay, that's a pretty good pop-up, pretty good hit to the outfield. All right. And the outfielder runs underneath it and catches it. So 40 meters up. Yf, I'll write it down here, Yf is equal to Yi plus Viy times T plus one half in parentheses G times T squared. 
And that is the same equation we had on the other side. But now, the, the x-coordinate has its own equation. Before, the x-coordinate was just 0. xi plus vi x times t. Uh, is there anything else that I need to write here? No. Why not? There's no gravity? Incorrect. There's no horizontal gravity. So this one stops right here at vix times t. And where do I get vix? Well, that's just in my launch vector. vix comma viy. And I'll give it 0 for the viz component. OK. And everything else is the same, and all the potential energies. Now, the thing about this is the kinetic energy. Uh, let me ask you a question. The previous diagram, we started with kinetic energy at the top. Does this one have kinetic energy at the top of its motion? It doesn't have any kinetic energy? No. It has the height of the kinetic energy? It doesn't have the most. It actually ha it doesn't have zero. It does have the least, however. And that's because it still has a little bit of sideways motion. That component never goes away. So every on this trajectory, The kinetic energy is never zero on account of the fact, the, the highly scientific principle of there's no such thing as horizontal gravity. So vi, vix, this one is constant. All right? And because of that, now you do get minimum kinetic energy up here, okay? Yes, that is a minimum. And maybe that's what you were thinking of. But it's not zero. A straight drop down, yes. Or straight pop up, yes. At the top of a pop up, you have zero kinetic energy. But this one, no, you still got a little bit of joules of kinetic energy up there. Everything else, though, is ditto. I love ditto marks. <laughs> What's that? Ditto? What does it mean? Ditto? Hold on a second. I dropped. I'm so surprised by that question, I dropped my pen. <laughs> Just came flying out. What does ditto mean? Uh, what ditto means is the same. Everything else, you know, ditto marks. So, you ever seen this? Ditto marks? You know, like, so for instance, all right, we'll fill in some of the mystery of the ditto marks. Um, choose a point on the second half of the arc below the halfway point. So right about here, all right, and we'll call that point P. All right, that'll have coordinates x, p, comma, y, p, comma, and we'll call it zero for the z coordinate. All right. Now the GPE, so the ditto marks means GPE at point p is equal to, oh boy. Yeah, so that's at point P. Don't, that's not GPE at momentum. It's not GPE at pressure. It's GPA at point P. I'll even put a little arrow up there. Is uh, MG 
YP. Whoa. Let me just drop my earbuds here. This is not optimal, but... All right. Uh, here's a question for you. If VIY is 20 meters per second, how long till it gets to point A, apogee? Question mark. Can you figure that out? If it starts with 20 meters per second of upward speed, how long does it take to get to where it has no upward speed? Remember how to figure that out? Raise your hand if you remember how to figure that out. Nobody knows how to figure that out. Nobody's saying. Well, here's, a, you remember how to do it? What do you, what do you do? Two seconds, yeah, because every second, you lose 9.8, so if you start with 20, you're gonna, it's about 2.04, something like that, or 2.02. .02. Now, hey, you guys, let me ask you this. Could you figure out If I tell you this is 15 meters per second for VIX, could you figure out the total kinetic energy? Then I think. Could you figure out total kinetic energy if I tell you VIX? Total energy, either here or here or here. Could you figure that out? or anywhere, how would you do it? Raise your hand if you wanna be bold. Did you write down my question? If you know this and this, if you know the initial velocity, 15 meters per second comma 20 meters per second comma zero, if you know that, can you figure out Anything else? Yeah. Repeat? The mass? Oh, yeah, it's a baseball. Yeah, you do need the mass. Okay, so you need mass. So if you have the mass, you can figure out all this stuff. Matter of fact, if you have the mass, you can figure out kinetic energy right here. And that's zero potential energy. So if you figure out kinetic energy at the bottom of your table, at the y equals zero level, that's good. You just go across and figure out the, the total energy and then build up the rest of your table. And matter of fact, I'm not sure that this is correct here. So put a question mark over here. That was just a what if. Matter of fact, let's figure this out. How high does this thing go Twenty meters per second initial speed. Uh, let's see. Delta T is equal to V I Y times G or divided by G. Uh, can somebody calculate that? Twenty meters per second divided by nine point eight meters per second squared. It's going to be twenty point something. 2.04, okay, so this is 2.04. Okay, now square that. So delta T squared, and so that's gonna be 4.0 something. 4.016, 4.16, okay. So 4.16 seconds squared. 
Okay, multiply that by 4.9 meters per second squared. And so that's going to be about, it's going to be about 20 meters. 20 point what? 20.4? Okay. So 20.4 meters. Okay, so cross out 40. Put in 20.4 meters up here. Okay. And that's going to be righteous. Now you can figure everything out the wazoo. You got everything except for the mass. So you need, you know, so is it a frozen turkey or is it a baseball or is it an electron or what? But no matter what it is, you can, if you have the mass, you can lock everything in kinetic energy wise. All right. Let me pause for questions. Energy. So all the energy considerations are the same here because it's, it's mg delta y and delta k is mg with a minus sign times delta y. We're not done yet. We got two more to do. Oh, my wonderful students. We're, we're just getting to the good stuff. Question. Down here, uh, drop distance. And the reason I was, hey, you guys, why is it okay to use drop distance here? The reason is the time it takes to get to here is the same as the amount of time it takes to get back down to here. All right? And so the time it gets to go down here is the, t the time it takes to drop straight down from here. So that's one half GT squared. So if you can figure out the rise time, that's the same as the drop time from apogee, and therefore the same as the, the fall time, you know, along the arc. Okay, so that's why one half GT squared, it's kind of cheating. But if you secretly know the symmetries and stuff, I think, yeah, you can use it that way. Okay, another question. All right, let's go to the third document cam page. Circular trajectories. Oh, my wonderful students. All right, now. Draw a dot. Draw a circle around it. Okay. And this is going to be a circular orbit. Now, for comparison, I'm going to draw another really big circular orbit as a dotted line. So try to do... Okay, so this is Earth, and these are the, the paths of satellites. So let's say that they're going counterclockwise. Let's see. Centripetal force is mv squared over r for either one. The gravitational force is m of the satellite times the mass of the Earth. That'll be capital M times capital G divided by r squared. And that allows us to figure out orbital speeds 
and sizes. All right. Now, emphasize the word circular. Let's say that each satellite has the same size total energy. Capital E. All right. Okay, we'll call this, I'll draw a picture of the satellite. This is satellite B. This is satellite A. Okay. Now we know from analyzing this stuff that the mass of the satellite drops out. So it doesn't matter how big these two satellites are. All that matters is the size of the orbit. Um, and you can figure out all, this, uh, all these energy factors. So, for which one of these satellites is gravitational force, excuse me, for which one of these is gravitational acceleration larger? This one out here or this one here? Which one's larger, A or B? That's right. So acceleration of A is larger because it's closer. Okay. And that means the V of A is also larger. Kinetic energy is larger. And so in terms of energy, the energy of A, the total energy of A, and the total energy of B are the same. But the GPE of A is greater than the GPE, excuse me, the GPE of A is less than the GPE of B. B has the bigger potential energy because it's at a higher altitude, bigger apogee. Kinetic energy of A, this one's the one that's greater, okay? So this satellite out here, is, it's, it's moving, but not as much as this one. Okay, it's 11.45. There's no homework except to study. And I'll see you on Thursday. Same conditions as before. Question. But it's more than just a book. So, remember, lecture notes are your prime... Thing. So all this information is going to be on the like the parabolas and what's. Some of it is, and then. But is like for the chapter? Is it only chapter four? <sighs> I I was just saying to everybody that. Um,